Good evening. We are so glad that you could join us for Marburn Academy's free community parent webinar titled Helping Children with Anxiety Move Forward. This topic is on top of mind for many parents and caregivers, and we are confident that you will walk away with tools to help your child. Please um, ask questions throughout the webinar. So we're going to be using the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. Oops. Um, and we will get to as many questions as we can. For those of you who are not familiar with Marburn Academy, we are an independent day school devoted to serving the educational needs of bright students who learn differently due to dyslexia, executive function, difficulties, and attention issues. In addition to our school program, we believe in serving children with learning differences in our greater communities through our robust outreach programs. We offer resources such as these webinars, free early reading screenings, summer school, and our upcoming college expo. Turning our attention to this evening, I am honored to introduce our speaker. Dr. Duke is a licensed pediatric psychologist specializing in child and adolescent behavior, development, and learning. Dr. Duke is the founder of Savannah Behavioral Pediatrics, and she serves as the practice director overseeing all clinical services. Dr. Duke obtained her PhD from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and she received formal clinical training in pediatric psychology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center's Monroe Meyer Institute. Her clinical practice is focused on evidence-based assessment of developmental, behavioral, and learning concerns, as well as behavioral treatment of a wide range of childhood concerns, including anxiety. She works closely with parents and caregivers to address key behavioral, emotional, and social difficulties, and to improve children's skills across home, school, and community settings. Dr. Duke's clinical practice and research has resulted in several professional publications and presentations, and she has received a number of research awards for her work in the area of behavioral psychology. She is also a parent, and with her, along with her husband, they have three children, ages four, six, and nine. At this point, I'd like to welcome Dr. Duke. All right, I think I got it unmuted. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us this evening. I know this is in the, in the middle of a really busy work week for most of you, um, or in the middle of uh, getting ready for dinner and bedtime and everything else. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time out uh, to be with us this afternoon, this evening. So I'm, I am going to talk a little bit about helping children with anxiety moving forward, given the current circumstances that we're all facing. We are all in the sort of uncharted territory of COVID. So I'm really going to be kind of taking that lens to walk through how to protect our children from um, becoming too uh, to, you know, out of the ordinary with these changes that we're experiencing, but also to help them learn to manage anxiety in a healthy, appropriate way. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about what anxiety is, so what the origins of anxiety are, uh, and what the factors are that really make it either grow and become more unmanageable, or make it a little more manageable to, to handle. These are really the pieces that we as parents can focus on in terms of how we are reacting to or interacting with our children to make sure that we're really helping them to face life's challenges and, and in a skillful and healthy way. I'm gonna focus a little bit on what I have seen in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on the experience of anxiety for all of us, but with a particular lens on our, our children and adolescents and talk a little bit about kind of where things have, have kind of gone up until this point and what we can expect from here on out as we start to hopefully move toward more normality and more of a typical kind of routine. 
I'm also going to talk a little bit about when to address anxiety. So what are some of the things that you can start to look for to know this is something that we probably need to keep an eye on or address in some way. I'm going to try to spend a good portion of our time talking about some really practical uh, strategies that you guys could implement from today forward. And I'm going to focus on foundational strategies to prevent our children from becoming over anxious in all of these tumultuous changing times. And I'm also going to talk about some evidence based strategies for helping our children learn how to manage and handle anxiety in healthy ways. Uh, because we know that anxiety is a part of, it's, it's going to be a part of life. It's not something that we're going to get rid of, but we certainly want to teach our children how to manage it appropriately. So when we talk about what anxiety is, I don't really have to get into too much detail here because every one of you that are sitting here with me tonight have had the experience of anxiety. It is a natural, healthy human emotion. And when it's working properly, it is something that we want to have and experience. Um, so anxiety is sort of like our own internal alarm system. And just like our fire alarm or smoke alarm is designed to keep our houses safe so and to keep us safe in our houses. So the alarm goes off, tells us to get out of there and we stay safe. Anxiety is sort of our body's alarm system in much the same way. So whenever I encounter something that is either really dangerous or at least I think is dangerous, then my body sends out these alarm signals to me and it prepares me to get out of there and keep myself safe. And so when it's working the way it's supposed to, our alarm goes off, that anxiety comes up, and we feel all of those very real physiological changes that happen, that heart rate increase, um, sweating, muscle tension, all of those things that happen are in preparation to get us out of a potentially dangerous situation. So when it's working the way it's supposed to, we want to have our anxiety working with us because if it's not, we're going to be putting ourselves in a lot of really dangerous situations without any kind of alert to the fact that this is dangerous. And, you know, these are some common fears that we see throughout the developmental period. So you guys can kind of look and see where your children are in these different age ranges. And if you see worries or fears that your children are experiencing that are listed here, these are really common kind of typical categories that we would see children uh, be concerned about in these different periods. Now, anxiety is something that, like I mentioned, when we hit that sweet spot, it is working for us. So if you think this is how much anxiety we should have, that's when that alarm system is going off. It really is a dangerous situation when we get out of there. That really is helpful to us. If it's too little, then we're not going to be very motivated to either get out of there if it's dangerous or to even perform. So a little bit of anxiety can actually be really helpful for us in general. So think about your child studying for that upcoming test. If they have absolutely no anxiety about that test coming up, they may not study at all. They may not even look at the book. So we need a little bit of anxiety to motivate us to do things and to perform really well. And when we hit that sweet spot, that's when it's working for us and, and we are benefiting from having this natural healthy emotion. However, when anxiety gets to be too much, and really that's what I'm gonna be focused on today. There, is, there can be too little anxiety, but I'm really gonna focus on when it gets to be too much and it's getting in the way. And so if it's starting to disrupt your child's life in some way, if it's disrupting their academic performance, their social life, if it's disrupting anything about their day-to-day -day functioning, that is a clear indicator that we probably need to help them manage this in a little bit of a different way. 
So the things to look for in your child are avoidance. Avoidance is the hallmark of anxiety. So this might look like refusal to do certain things, refusal to perform certain tasks or engage in different activities. It may even be things that were previously enjoyable, but for some reason, there's something about that situation that has become uh, nerve wracking or anxiety provoking. And so the, the tendency is to try to get away from that situation. Also, when there are excessive aches and pains, you know, if, if we are on a high alert and our bodies are, are in this heightened state of alertness and arousal, and if we're in that state for too long of a time period, it's sort of like we're cranking up this spring that's just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And the byproduct of that is pain. And so we often see children have very real experiences of infrequent stomach aches, frequent headaches that are the byproduct of their little bodies being in fight or flight for a good portion of time when that's not really how our bodies were designed to be. Also excessive reassurance, seeking is something to look for. So we can see our children start to ask, is this gonna be okay? What's gonna happen when this, and asking about predicting future events. Um, so that kind of reassurance seeking is normal when it happens sometimes, but if you start to notice a pattern that that's happening repeatedly over and over and over and your child is unable to move on without your reassurance, that might be an indicator that it's time to really address some of those challenges. Also, any time sleeping or eating or our typical day-to-day -day functions are interrupted by worries or anxiety, that is also a time period where we really know that we need to kind of get back on track and, and help our children cope a little bit more um, appropriately. One interesting thing, so irritability and anger reactions, now they're not always an indicator of anxiety, but they certainly can be. And what I would have you guys look for is whether or not that anger reaction is helping them to avoid something that might be uncomfortable. So I, I have a perfect example of this. When my son was about, my oldest son, who's now nine, was about two. He was little and he was adorable and he had this tiny little voice and this little country accent. And we were at Target one day and all these women would come up and talk to him and, oh, you're so cute. And he was very uncomfortable around strangers at the time. And this woman came up and said, oh, hey, you're so cute. And he said, go away. <laughs> and of course I went, oh, <laughs> but you know, it was, it wasn't because he's an angry child and he wants everyone to be away from him. It was because it made him uncomfortable and she did just that, she went away. And so when you see that anger reaction or you see some irritability and it's designed to sort of shut something down that makes your child uncomfortable, that is an indicator that there may be some underlying anxiety contributing to that. Also, if our children have difficulties with attention and concentration, certainly there are other factors that can influence attention and concentration, but anxiety and worries can really interfere with the ability to focus and keep my mind where it's supposed to be. If in my mind I'm thinking about what could go wrong or I'm worrying about something, that's where my focus is going to be rather than on the task at hand. So where does this come from? Well, we, we've talked about the fact that this is a natural human emotion. We are kind of built with this from, from day one. However, the tendency to develop anxiety to an excessive degree um, has a couple of different sources of origin. And there's certainly a genetic component. So there is, it's definitely heritable. We see that anxiety runs in families. There's a great deal of research that suggests that there are increased rates of anxiety disorders among siblings and family members. And also for those of you who have multiple children, you will know they all come into the world different. They all just arrive 
and have a little bit of a different personality from day one. And that's that temperament piece. So the disposition that our children come into the world with can also impact whether or not they're likely to develop some excessive anxiety. So those who are slower to warm up and maybe a little more hesitant tend to uh, develop excessive anxiety a little bit more than others. Also learning, we, we can learn to feel anxious about certain things. We can learn about watching the reactions of other people. And we are social creatures. We are always watching what other people are doing, how they're reacting. And our children are constantly watching us to see what our reactions are gonna be. So we certainly, we see someone overreact or have a really big fear response in a specific situation that can invoke some anxiety in us as well. And so we can learn just by watching, oh, this should be scary that this is in fact scary to us. Also the experiences that we have can really change uh, or increase the anxiety we experience in different situations. So for example, there are certain things that can get paired together. So something that's naturally sort of fear inducing can get paired with something that's completely neutral and that thing then becomes sort of scary. So I have a, a great example of a time when my nephew, who is now 22, <laughs> he was probably about three years old and his dad had a, a glass cup. It was sitting on a coaster that was sitting on a glass table. And when he picks up the cup, the coaster stuck for just a second before it fell and burst through that glass table. My nephew sees this drinking glass, hears this loud sound of crashing glass. And from that point forward, that child would not go near a glass. He was okay with cups, but that glass made him feel nervous and fearful. And that's just one time of kind of pairing those things together created that reaction in him. And that, that can certainly happen with a number of things on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, avoidance can sometimes be rewarding. Um, so think about the child who, there's something about school that makes them nervous. There is something that academically or socially going on at school and they decide that they're, you know, maybe it's a big test, I'm just not gonna go. I'm gonna completely avoid that. And when they do that, they feel huh, relieved. I didn't have to take that big test. And on top of that, there may be added kind of benefits on the side. Maybe I get to hang out all day and sleep in and take naps and watch whatever I want to and eat whatever I want to, which is really enjoyable. So sometimes we can be sort of rewarded when we avoid certain things. And then that can make our anxiety grow around that specific thing. Also information and instructions. This is, you know, the way we talk to our children, what we say to them can make them either more or less fearful. So we can say things like, oh, that'll poke your eye out, or this is going to be terrible. And that can be really anxiety provoking just in the, the language that we're using. So how does anxiety grow? How is anxiety maintained once it gets to be too much? And the biggest piece, and like I mentioned before, anxiety or avoidance is the hallmark of anxiety. So escape and avoidance are the things that fuel anxiety. So I wanna give you guys an example to really illustrate what this looks like. So this was probably about 10 years ago now, I had a child that I treated who was afraid of dogs. And the, his mother really did not know where this came from. There was no identifiable event. And by the way, that's really common. There's not usually some identifiable event that occurs that creates anxiety or fear. Um, usually we just start to see that this, this nervousness starts to occur. So this child became very afraid of dogs. 
He knew there was a dog a couple of houses down from them. And so what he started to do to avoid that dog is he started to take different routes around his neighborhood when he'd go play with his friends in the neighborhood. And then he started to learn where all the dogs were in the neighborhood. And he started taking these really unusual and roundabout paths to get to his friends' houses. And his parents were saying that, you know, he had had gotten all of these really unusual pathways down because he knew where every dog was in the neighborhood. Well, then one day he realized as he's walking his unusual path, a family walks by with their dog, not on a leash, and he realizes dogs can be anywhere. He stopped going to play in the neighborhood because dogs could be anywhere in the neighborhood. And it, it got to the point uh, where his mother said at, at one point he would not even look out the window because he may see a dog. So I want you to think about what this looks like on a big scale. So his world used to look like this, my whole neighborhood. I can go to my entire neighborhood. I can play wherever I want to. And then I notice there's a dog that I don't really want to go around. So I make I make my paths a little smaller. And then I change my paths again to avoid these other places. And then I decide I'm not even gonna go out there. I'm just gonna stay in my house. And then I don't look out the window and look how small my world becomes. The more he's avoiding, the less he's engaged in, in life in general. And that is where avoidance is really that anxiety fuel and it also creates a lot of interference for our children and, and potentially for us as well. So what happens when we get out of a situation that makes us feel uncomfortable is there, there are a couple things that happen at once. First, just like this kiddo who's avoiding his dog, he goes, oh, I don't have to be around that any dogs, I'm safe. So there's this immediate relief and this feeling that, oh, that felt good. I think I'm gonna do that again next time. Then there's also at the same time, not an opportunity to learn that that situation's not really dangerous. So he is, you know, at the same time as this child is feeling relieved, he also never learns that the dog a couple of doors down doesn't jump. He just would lick ya. Um, he's not scary. So what happens over time with this kind of pattern is a, avoidance becomes the coping tool. And when avoidance is our way that we manage anxiety, it makes our world incredibly small. So, I wanna kind of talk a little bit about how this avoidance uh, is related to the pandemic and all of the changes that we're all experiencing as a product of COVID-19. And one of the things that has happened is we've had a lot, in a lot of ways, our worlds have become smaller because they've had to become smaller for safety purposes. So we've had some initial lockdowns. We've had periodic lockdowns. If you have family members who have tested positive or people that you've been exposed to or symptoms. So there've been all these times where we're kind of drawing back and away from the world in multiple ways. And our typical routines have been completely upended. Uh, even doing things socially, if we're still able to connect with others socially, it often looks very different. So, you know, under different circumstances, I might be standing in a room with you guys. I might be talking to you and looking in your eyes and, um, you know, giving you this information in person, but things are looking different these days. And, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of distance learning, so our school setting looks different. There is a big economic impact, whether it's because we had to shut down temporarily or jobs have been lost. But there are all of these multiple, multiple changes, many of which sort of induce some avoidance of aspects of life that we used to be exposed to routinely. And one of the things that I've noticed, and particularly back in March and April, I was having these telehealth visits with a lot of my 
adolescents who can kind of verbalize to me their experiences. And when I was talking with my adolescents who I was working with on managing anxiety, I saw this, this huge anxiety relief happening as a product of having to shut everything down. And I actually had some of my adolescents saying things to me like, oh, well, you know, everything's really great because nobody can go anywhere. So I'm really not worried about this or that or the other because I know everybody's just at home, everybody's safe. So it initially, when we went into the pandemic, it initially created some of that relief. And that is what keeps people going back to avoidance is that initial relief. But what we've seen with COVID and what we see with ongoing avoidance is the longer we make our worlds really small like this, the byproduct is we're not doing things that we enjoy as much. It can start to really impact our moods. It can start to make us feel down. And one of the things that the, it'll be helpful to think about as a parent moving forward during this time period is that we are hopefully soon uh, going to be heading back into more normality. We've got a vaccine coming down the road. It, there are all signs of pointing to, we're going to be getting back into more typical types of routines. And after a really long period of avoidance of different types of activities, social activities, um, other types of interactions, this is going to be really challenging, particularly for those who are predisposed to being over anxious. So when we're pushing them back into their world, um, that's, the, that's the time when we're probably gonna see some pushback and it's going to be really challenging. So moving into that, we wanna think about how to manage anxiety in a healthy way. And the goal is never to eliminate anxiety because we really do need it. It is there for a reason. We just wanna send a message to our children that it's okay to have this feeling, but that we need to pay attention to it to see if it's alerting us to danger or if it's tied to something that maybe is not in fact dangerous. And this is really akin to stopping to see when, you're, when your smoke alarm goes off, stopping to see, is there really smoke? Is there really fire? We're not just gonna take the batteries out of our alarm and pretend like we, we don't hear it and we avoid the alarm itself. We really wanna check out what it's telling us. And you know, one of the things that I see happen all the time, and I really think this is, it is for our generation of parents, it is, particularly um, prevalent. And that is that we have so much pressure to be the perfect parents, to do everything and be everything for our children. And there's this intense pressure to really protect our children. And so we have a lot of pressure from multiple sources to feel like we need to protect our children. And of course, when we see our children in distress, we don't like that. Nobody likes to see their children struggling. And so there is a tendency to jump in and scoop them up and save them. And if you feel this tendency, it just means that you are a, a normal, good parent. I feel this way all the time, like, oh, I just wanna scoop them up. But the thing that can happen if we rescue our children and we try to protect them from, from anxiety or anxiety provoking situations is, we are the ones sort of doing this external calming for them. And they really need to be tasked with managing their emotions and their anxiety on their own because they are, we're, we're teaching them to be independent human beings who are gonna grow up and, and stand on their own two feet. So they really need the responsibility of learning to manage this in a healthy way. One of the things that can happen too is that that reassurance seeking that I mentioned before that can start to happen repeatedly. If I'm reporting worries and I say, oh, I'm so worried about this and I don't know what's gonna happen and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this. The tendency for parents is to wanna jump in right then and say, oh yes, you can. You, oh, and I've seen you do this and I've seen you do that and provide a lot of reassurance. And what happens when we do that at the moment of a worry is our children go, 
I feel better. And now we have managed their anxiety for them and they're gonna keep coming to us again and again to manage that for them. And what will eventually, what can happen is that they can start to practice worrying. Now I'm gonna tell my worries to you every time because you make it go away for me. So I'm gonna keep reporting these. And we know that anything we practice, we get better at. Practice makes perfect. So if I'm worrying a lot, that is going to be, I'm gonna be practicing thinking in that way, thinking in that kind of fearful mindset. And that is gonna really get in the way. So I'm not telling you guys not to reassure your children. And we'll talk about when is a good time for that because I want you guys to send them all those awesome reassuring messages. Um, but we're going to talk about sort of separating it away from worry reporting or reassurance seeking so that that doesn't become a pattern or a cycle that our children get into. And in terms of just prevention, um, just really having some foundational pieces in place to make sure that our children are well equipped and feel secure in their day to day lives when there are so many changes going on around us. One of the things that we really want to think about is either keeping our routines as consistent as possible. So trying to have as many of our typical routines as we did pre COVID now, or if we've sort of gotten out of routine, which most of us have because this has been a very big shift for everyone. Um, it's reintroducing some of those routines and having a consistent daily structure, knowing, having predictability in my day really helps me to manage some of those bigger unknowns, like what's going to happen next week or next year. And one of the, the tendencies during ever changing time periods like this when we're in the middle of all this uncertainty and all of these changes, it is very tempting as a parent to say, oh, you know what, sure, have, have as much chocolate as you want. Yeah, you can, you can play your game for 10 hours. I guess that's okay. And you know what, I, I feel the temptation too to, to be a little more permissive. However, if we think about what's happening is our, our children and our adolescents, their worlds have been really changed. And if we are also changing things at home or loosening boundaries that they're accustomed to, that's gonna make them feel less secure and less safe. So we really need to think about, yes, being supportive and being warm and caring, but also keeping those boundaries in place as much as we possibly can and staying pretty, pretty strict with those boundaries because that predictability that is perceived by our children when we have really clear, consistent boundaries, that really promotes security for them, particularly when everything else around them is changing. We also wanna encourage healthy habits, exercising, sleeping. We know that sleep is so critical to overall functioning. So we want our children to be getting an adequate amount of sleep. We also wanna think about that sleep schedule and keeping that schedule as consistent as possible. So we really don't want more than about an hour shift in our children's sleep schedules on any given day. So yes, weekends, we might say you could sleep in a little bit, but we really don't want that shift to be too drastically different. It needs to be fairly consistent to really give us a good foundation. Also, our children are exposed to so many different things these days in the media. They have access to all of this information that we never did as children. And so it's really important to monitor what our children are exposed to and really try to limit the exposure um, and make sure that what they're seeing is developmentally appropriate. Um, and, and that can be a really big challenge at this point, but it's really critical that we don't have our children seeing things that are beyond their, their ability to cope and manage anxiety for specific areas. Also, one of the best things that we can do for our children is to really connect with them in a predictable and consistent way. So one of the things that you can do, you could start this tonight, you could start this tomorrow. This is something that is very simple to do, but I'll tell you, it's hard to carve out the time. 
Um, even though I'm going to tell you five minutes, five minutes starts to look like a lot in our really busy routines. If we carve out five minutes, and this is time, I know you're spending tons and tons of time with your children, but with this piece, what I want you to think about is having a check-in time, having a bonding time. I'm going to sit down. I don't have my phone. It's in a totally different room. I don't have any screens. Nothing electronic is on around us. I am fully present with you in this moment. And carve out five minutes of doing something enjoyable with each other. We get so busy in our day-to-day -day routines and so many things around us are pressing and we, we feel these, this need to do all these different things that it can be incredibly helpful for our children to carve out even five minutes of connection time with us. And because the connections with other people, friends, and sometimes even teachers or other school faculty have become virtual, we really want to capitalize on that in-person connection that we have with our children. So this is really works best too. If you can make this a predictable part of your child's routine. So this is every night after dinner or right after you're done with your homework. We have some one-on-one -on -one time or bonding time or hangout time, however you want to refer to it. But we want to make it so that it's predictable and that our children know to expect it every day. And they really are relying on their connection with us to learn how to interact with the world. So when they connect with us, we become that secure base that they can then go out into the world from. So having that connection really kind of fosters security. Also, we've talked a little bit about how, yes, our children are watching what we do. And observation is certainly a form of learning that they're, they're using. So they're watching how we manage our world. And we really want to demonstrate calm coping in the face of challenging situations. Now, by this, I do not mean that you should always act as though nothing gets to you and you're not fearful at all. I think it's oftentimes really helpful to communicate in a, in, in a calm way that we feel a little nervous about something, but that we're taking a step to address it anyway. So I'll, I'll give you guys an example of something that I have really worked hard on in this arena. So... In the South, and if you guys have, have ever been to any of the Southern states, I know Savannah, Georgia is not alone in this, but we have these bugs that are called palmetto bugs. That is really a fancy word for gigantic flying wrench. Uh, so these are things that in my childhood, I developed a very big fear response to. My sister would have these big reactions. My mother had these big reactions to them. And I developed the same kind of reaction. And so now, never fails, every summer, two or three of those at some point or another, they're going to come into your house. And so now I am very mindful of the fact that I need to maintain some composure. And my children know, I've told them that this is, I'm, I'm not good with bugs. <laughs> so what I try to do now is kind of model that, that internal reaction that I'm having, kind of give them, be transparent with my reaction and say, all right, guys, you know, mom's not good with bugs. I feel really uncomfortable around these bugs, but we got to get it out of the house. It can't hang out in here. So I'm going to have you guys help me hunt for it. And so just kind of demonstrating that, yes, I'm uncomfortable, but I'm still going to try to manage the situation. And this kind of modeling this tolerance for feeling anxiety is really helpful for our children because sometimes there can be this learning experience where, you know, that feeling of anxiety, the, the actual sensations associated with it are paired with perceived danger so much that the sensations themselves can start to be seems sort of scary. And so this really models for our children that just having the sensations of feeling nervous is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we also want to model a tolerance for uncertainty. It is okay to answer your child's question with an I don't know, because we don't know everything. 
And we want to show that it's okay to not know and be okay with that. And it may make us feel a little uncomfortable not knowing, but we can still kind of go on to the next step. And one of the things that, that I sort of alluded to earlier as well is making sure that we're really aware of what we're talking about and how we're discussing it around our children. We really want to make sure that the things that we're talking about are developmentally appropriate and we want to answer questions in an honest way, but really make sure that it's not too much information because there certainly is such a thing as too much information. I am certainly not going to be sharing uh, terrorist attack information with my four-year-old. That would just be something that's beyond her ability to cope with at this point. So we really want to make sure that we are um, limiting overexposure to anxiety provoking types of situations, um, but allowing our children to be able to sit with some of the uncertainty or um, anxiety that goes along with safe day-to-day -day types of things. So as part of this, you know, we're, we're talking about encouraging our children, and I'm going to talk about developing this bravery mindset, but certainly I am not advocating that if your child is afraid of water, that you go throw them in a pool. Um, that is certainly not an approach that we want to take. What we do want to do is start to help our children develop a mindset of bravery. So saying things like, Yes, you might be a little nervous about whatever the situation is, but it's not dangerous and you got this. And even giving them little things that they can say to themselves when they're already calm, when it's not something that's happening in that moment, you know, if they're already calm, you can give them things to say like, I got this, I can do it, I'm, I'm gonna be okay. And if they practice saying things like that, they're going to get better at thinking in that way and thinking in that resilient way. So we want to kind of model that for our children and help them to develop that sort of mindset that I can do this. I am going to be okay. And we want to make sure that this, these really are situations that are not dangerous because there certainly are situations where we want their anxiety to work properly and we want them to be aware of danger and we do want them to avoid dangerous situations. So this is part of that learning process of learning what is not dangerous. Oh, a test, a test is not dangerous. It, it feels really uncomfortable. It feels the same as if I encountered a snake in the woods um, but it's not going to bite me. It's not going to hurt me. It just feels uncomfortable. And I can learn to kind of sit through that until I feel a little more calm. Another piece that we want to kind of think about, your, as a parent, your biggest tool is attention. Anything you pay attention to, and I do mean anything, will happen more. And this is true for your two-year-olds. This is true for your 18-year-olds and even your spouses and your family members. Um, but anything we pay attention to, people notice that. It really kind of sets the values for our household. What I put my attention on and what I label and what I point out for my children shows them what I really care about. And so if I am really focused on catching moments of calm, catching moments of, of bravery where you hung in there even though it was tough, that's going to go a long way with my child. So this might be a situation where your, your child did something really small, and that is okay. For example, for the, the kiddo that I mentioned before with the fear of dogs, you know, looking out the window might be something that as his parent, I would want to say, I am so impressed that you are looking out the window. I know that makes you feel uncomfortable, but you really were brave. And so it's important to try to find these pieces, let our children know when we see them being successful in really small ways, because this really cultivates self-efficacy in our children. When they hear, you did this, you did an awesome job hanging in there. I know that was uncomfortable, but you really were brave. They go, oh yeah, I didn't do that. 
I, I was successful with that. And they start to recognize it and realize that they have more ability to manage those challenging emotions than they realized that they did. So even picking out and, and pointing out these small little steps that are just, you know, you felt uncomfortable, but you really kept it together. You didn't hightail it out of there. Um, that, is, that goes a really, really long way, more than it seems like um, it should because it's, it's fairly easy to do, uh, but it does take being on the lookout for it. And sometimes it's hard to catch those really little things. So it's really important to kind of keep our eyes out for those, those small little steps of bravery. There are times when we want to talk a little less. So if there are big reactions, I want you guys to think about what happens when our bodies go into fight or flight. If I am in a situation that puts me into fight or flight and I am here in terms of my anxiety and my fear response, one of the things that happens is my brain, my, my frontal lobe that's responsible for all that great problem solving, it sort of shuts down a little bit. And this is really by design. If I am in a really dangerous situation, I don't want to stop and go through every alternative I have for how to handle this and then decide which one is the best one. I do not want to be doing a lot of thinking. I just want to get the heck out of there. So when our children go here and they're really, really nervous, so they're really worked up about a certain situation, event, object, this is not a good time for reasoning. They are not operating at their full capacity. They're not going to be able to take in that great information that you're giving them. All the content of your message is gonna go in one ear and out the other. And then what's left is just your attention. And remember what we said about attention. Anything we pay attention to, it's gonna happen more. And we certainly don't want to accidentally fuel that type of reaction in our children. So reassurance, is not a bad thing. It's not an evil thing. Giving rationales, is, it's not a bad thing. These are all things we as good parents do. However, it's when we do them that's really critical. So if you carve out those five minutes to have some one-on-one -on -one time with your child, this is an awesome time to check in and to just provide reassurance unprompted when everybody's already calm. Because we want to save all of our awesome information are all of our parent lectures that we know are just full chock full of great teaching and advice we want to save those for the times when our children are already calm and they can actually process and benefit from that information now if you find that you're trying some of these little strategies here and there and your child isn't responding to these or if you're not even finding tiny little steps in the right direction, then this is probably a good indicator that it's time to find an expert who can really help you navigate managing anxiety in a healthy way. One good place to start is with your pediatrician. Pediatricians are a wealth of information that can give you some tips and they certainly know the area and can provide you with referrals who specialize in managing anxiety. If you want to look for a specialist yourself, a pediatric psychologist with a specialty or expertise in anxiety is always a, a good place to start. So I'm going, and I can see that you guys have had some questions here and there. So I'm now going to get a little bit of time to go through some of those questions that you guys have, have posted throughout. All right, wonderful. So um, Dr. Duke, the first question is, are repetitive movements also a sign of anxiety, like tapping an object three times? So certainly repetitive behaviors or movements can be indicators of anxiety. So if I'm nervous and my, my body is sort of working overtime, I might be doing things like tapping. If I'm really getting into doing something a certain number of times, sometimes if you look into that behavior a little more closely and see what's happening with that behavior. It can give you a little more information. So if you ask your child, when you tap this three times, what happens? And does that make you feel more comfortable after you get done doing that three times? And if they say, oh yeah, that makes me feel so much more comfortable. It can be just sort of a way to relieve anxiety. And 
can get to the point where it can start to get in the way. So if a child's tapping their, their pen three times, that's probably not going to interfere with your day-to-day -day life. However, if they're spending hours tapping a certain number of time and it, and it is interfering with, they, they won't even stop and get in the shower, they won't stop and eat their food, that's when you know, okay, this is interfering. It's gotten to that point where we need to do something. Wonderful. All right. Your, the next question is, any tips for parents with anxiety trying to help a child who also copes with anxiety? Uh, we tend to feed off each other's neuroses. <laughs> Oh, yes. So it, that story that I told you guys about the, the giant cockroaches, that is a, that is a real struggle for me. And, and actually, it's interesting because, you know, I, I know you guys are, are dealing with this as parents, and I'm dealing with this as a parent and a clinician, but I really had um, in the past a lot of anxiety around insects. And I've worked with some children who had insect fears and we would have to go insect hunting and get these, you know, have these little bug cages and have these insects and sit with them and let them sit, sit on us. And, you know, for, for me, it was treatment as well. So I'm kind of modeling this, but at the same time, I am experiencing my own kind of, yes, I can cope with this. I can handle this, this feeling of discomfort. I know that this is a safe insect and it's not going to hurt me. So I think, you know, knowing yourself, knowing what those situations, events, objects are that make you feel uncomfortable is absolutely the first step. So if you know these are the things that make me feel uncomfortable, you can be much more prepared in learning to cope with those while you're in the presence of your child. And like I said, you don't have to be perfect. Our children are not looking to us to be perfect with things. They can see us feel uncomfortable and rein it in and go, oh my goodness, there's a roach. Okay, you guys know I'm not too cool with roaches, but I'm gonna take a deep breath and let's figure out how to get it out of the house. So I think it's okay to have that reaction sometimes and then model kind of bringing it back in and and getting it together because that's that's real life that is being a human parent all right the next question is my child is displaying symptoms that could be associated with either anxiety or depression i often hear those terms mentioned together how do you differentiate between the two so anxiety and depression can often co-occur and sort of like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, if anxiety is really the precursor, so if you notice avoidance of things and uh, worries or things like that, and they start to use avoidance as a coping strategy, when our worlds get small, the byproduct is not feeling right. We're not engaged in the things that we used to care about and the things that we used to like doing. And when that happens, it makes us feel down and it can actually create some depressive symptoms in us. And so those two things can really go together if our children are really heavily relying on avoidance as a way to manage that feeling of nervousness. Um, there's not always the need to really differentiate and say exactly what is it that's going on here. We know that having and our child takes steps toward the things that they care about is a really helpful way of addressing both anxiety and depression. So if I know that my child is feeling down and they haven't been doing things that they really care about doing, like connecting with their friends, then kind of pushing them to have a, have a video chat or doing something that would be enjoyable can be a helpful step. If there's a lot of pushback there, then chances are you're gonna be in, in better shape if you seek out an expert to help you navigate. Okay, next question. My daughter's social studies class discusses current events as part of the curriculum, and this triggers her anxiety. Part of me wants her excused from these parts of the lesson, but I don't wanna shield her from engaging in this type of conversation, especially when she's in high school. What do you recommend? So I think it's important to be aware of what kind of information is being shared and in, in what way it's being discussed. So having a lot of communication, open lines of communication between you know, yourself and the teacher can be really helpful for knowing exactly what they're talking about and how they're presenting the information. Information. Uh, I, I would tend to agree that yes, if this is something that's part of a typical high school class, 
and we know that everybody in the class is being tasked with listening to these, you know, this ever-changing world that we're in, um, really the best approach would be to help her learn how to manage that and to be, to have a safe space for her to come and say, okay, that made me feel a little uncomfortable and kind of helping her learn how to move forward through that. And if, if that becomes really overwhelming or starts to interfere to an excessive degree, then potentially seeking out someone who might be able to help her navigate. What do you, what do you do when a kid refuses to sleep at night? even after you set time and they go to their bedroom, but are found waiting for you at the top of the steps an hour and a half later. Child is age nine and she says she can't sleep alone. So the interesting thing about sleep is however we go to sleep at the beginning of the night, whether we have some white noise playing or we have a night light on or our parent is hanging out in the room with us. However we go to sleep at the beginning of the night becomes this sort of sleep association. So if mom's in the room with me or dad or grandma or whoever it is that, that is typically in the room with me, every time I go to sleep, then I, need, I start to need that to be around me to be able to go to sleep. And so this is a really kind of tricky situation to navigate without someone kind of walking you through it. But certainly there are some strategies that are helpful in getting your child to kind of take steps toward going, you know, go, getting closer and closer to, to the bed, going with, you know, with you out of the room a little bit or, or back a little ways. So there are ways to sort of fade yourself out of that situation. But if this is something that's happening and it's creating, you know, a, a one and a half hour time period before your child can fall asleep, it might be a good idea to seek out a pediatric psychologist because if, you know, if someone called me with that, I would say, oh, this is, you know, three, four sessions. And we're, we're going to put some things in place and then, then we'll get, we'll get them sleeping in their, their bed, or at least get, get you guys on track to do that. So it's, it's not something that would be incredibly time consuming, but do you think it'd be really helpful to have somebody walk you through those pieces? Great. Thank you. And our final question for the evening is a program called coping cats was recommended to us to help with anxiety. Have you heard of this program? Yes, I have. So I'm, I'm very familiar with Coping Cat. It is an evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for anxiety. And the approach essentially gives children some, some coping tools, some strategies that they can use in the face of anxiety provoking situations. And then they, together with their therapist, kind of start taking baby steps toward those situations and using the tools that they've learned to, to cope appropriately. So that it's a great, it's a great program and that could be a really helpful set of tools for your child. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Duke. This was incredibly informative and really shared in a way that I think most parents can relate to. Um, I love the idea of the mindset of bravery. I've never thought about it in that way. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us um, this evening. Be on the lookout for an email that will come your way with some resources from tonight's webinar and have a great night. Good night.